please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. You look at a region which is making headlines for, for all kinds of reasons really. Uh, so Pedro, let me start with you. What we're seeing right now is this sudden new wave of risk uh, aversion towards emerging markets. Uh, now, whether it's trade wars or, you know, or something else, the currency sell-off that started off, um, is this just a passing phenomena? Or do you see this spiraling into something a little more significant? Yes, um, I think uh, the weaknesses in the current market uh, are, are very important alarm bells. Okay, so we, we've got uh, year-to-date emerging market currencies down 13%. So India is not alone mm -hmm. into that. The outliers are the Argentine peso, the Turkish lira. Uh, see at the second level, you can see the South African rand, the Brazilian real, the Russian ruble, and then on a third level comes India rupee and the Indonesia rupiah. Okay. So I think the core reasons why those currencies are weak it's not necessarily trade. It started before that. Mm -hmm. It is the exceptionally strong moment that the U.S. economy is facing. GDP growth of 3% for this year. Um, EPS growth in the equity market of 25% uh, this year. And the Fed tightening the process. So what in those moments, what usually happens is that investors' mm -hmm. scrutiny about fragilities increase. Sure. And then we're back to the 90s, right? So two, two things, you know. One, which are uh, the current account and nominal fiscal deficit countries that offer fragilities? As a ballpark, we look into the minus 2% of GDP in those, those both uh, axes. I think the good news for us trying to answer your question is that 75% of MSCI emerging market equities don't fall into that category. But you've got a few countries mm -hmm. that have those twin assets, right? So obviously Turkey and Argentina were there. You have South Africa, you have India, Brazil borderline, then a little bit Indonesia, Mexico as well. And in those, the majority of those countries happen also to face elections, right? Sure. So either this year and sure. into next year. So I suspect the noise of exceptionally strong dollar, uh, exceptionally strong U.S. economy will continue to create some pressure. Now, what's the consequence of that? Mm. The consequence is, the, is, is a process, right? Currency weakens, inflation passes through, you have to tighten domestic monetary policy. That implies, most of cases, growth is slowed down, Michelle? which makes the budget balance a little bit tougher to achieve, and then when necessary, you knock on your Congress, ask for help, say I'm doing my part, I'm cutting expenditures, but I might need temporary taxes. And when extreme, you knock on the IMF door and, and ask for money. But I don't that think... That sounds like a very vicious circle. I mean, are, are we uh, going to go there or... No. Sort of, yeah. no. So the good news, as I said before, 75% of the index is not there. Mm. And I don't think it is anywhere close to that. So mm. the only country that fulfills all those tasks here today has been urgent to you. So I think the worry is whether India will play catch up with the rest of the EM complex on the way down because we haven't corrected as much. Is that a possibility? I think there's some critical differences for India relative to, to the rest of emerging markets. And, and ultimately, investors come to emerging markets for growth. And India, with one of the fastest growing economies in the world, has outperformed through the first part of this cycle for very real underlying fundamental reasons. One of the key things that we discuss with investors quite often, and at this conference as well, is this idea of relative growth rates of the U.S. versus emerging markets. I think what we have to do is take a step back and realize that the U.S. government, through the, its tax cut, effectively poured gas on a fire, and we're in the process of burning that gas off, which is leading to this concept of U.S. exceptionalism. And can the U.S. continue to outgrow by so much? Mm. If this is a process of gas burning off a fire, that's going to drop back to trend as we enter 2019 mm -hmm. and offer the opportunity for emerging market outperformance again. So do you see a bottom to some of this anywhere in sight close by? Because the, the two factors that we're looking at most closely are A, relative growth rates, and then B, currency trends. And obviously, they're very interlinked. One of the biggest shifts that we see today versus earlier this year, in January, markets overall were very short the U.S. dollar. We're 180 degrees opposite to that position today. From a broader emerging markets perspective, investors were long after a very strong performance in 2017. Now we've seen significant outflows on a year-to-date basis. India is a slight exception to that, um, <coughs> obviously, given, given its top performance. And so I think that we're starting to see the dy dynamics lining up for potentially better emerging market performance going forward. Overhanging that are issues like trade concerns.
Okay. If, so if, to come, uh, yeah, yeah. If I may add to that, because th that's a critical point. So yeah. how far advanced into value destruction are we into that? So we talked about currencies. Let's do a deeper dive into into the equity market. Uh, we're seeing the combination of three interesting things by now. So number one, the price collapse we saw on emerging market equities has been in excess of the negative earnings revisions. Mm -hmm. So that means that valuation became more compelling. On an absolute basis, emerging market is trading back to its historical average, mm -hmm. meaning that all this extra liquidity pumped by the G4 central bank's expansion, uh, balance sheet expansion has not been distorting any more valuations for yen. And the second one, which is even more compelling, is lies in the fact that relative to developed market equities, mm. set aside the US, which mm. is off the charts, the discount now is close to 15%. Mm -hmm. okay. The other thing we're seeing is positioning. So the share of emerging markets over global mutual funds, it's now at 7.4%. Historical average is 9.2. Okay. It's not much percentage-wise, but the base is 18 trillion dollars. Sure. So it's. So I yeah. get the sense here in both of you that at some point this is going to turn. This very easy short EM, short EM currency trade should turn. The question is, uh, what next for India? Because India hasn't fallen as much at all. Do you see this correction deepening here? Um, I think uh, uh, your India strategist, I think the, the base case scenario for the Nifty is 11,300, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what next for the Indian equity market? Okay. Um, India has uh, two very good things for now. Number one, if trade noise escalates, you're going to be disproportionately less affected mm -hmm. than the rest of the year. And that's pretty much what has been happening over the past two quarters, you would take. Uh, second, uh, India has a very strong base of earnings growth. So everything else constant, you might grow here 15% of your earnings. Why? Demographics, infrastructure spending, and the reforms, in, which in essence is government shrinking, giving away for the private sector to perform. Now, having said that, uh, what we think is going to come next, call it let's in the next one or two quarters, it's a bit of a headwind. Okay? Um, number one, uh, you have the election calendar, right? So state assemblies, general election to next year, and that will permeate the discussion of fiscal, right? So what does, let's say, uh, does that mean for inflation, fiscal dynamics? Uh, number two, it's uh, valuation, right? So unlike emerging markets, the correction, as you say, in, in the Indian equity market hasn't been that pronounced. So the market continues to trade close to 19 times forward P, mm -hmm. which is more or less one standard deviation above of average. That was not a problem beginning of the year because everybody else was one standard deviation up. Now, mm -hmm. as I said before, emerging markets is, is, uh, is back to average. And the third one could be some external noise, meaning taxes on long-term capital gains being applied into next year, 10%. Uh, this MSCI discussion about, let's say, Am I going to be tweaking the no, in their weights? Yes, yeah. or not. Yeah. Yeah. So we suspect that on a relative basis, uh, there is a chance that Indian equity markets could be lagging emerging markets over the next two quarters. Okay. On an absolute basis, as you say, we will continue to eye returns close to nine, eight to nine percent, as per the index reference you gave. Okay, um, James, just to come down to then themes within India, yeah. if you're talking about <coughs> maybe relative underperformance. Um, what would investors uh, rather buy if they were to buy in this correction? Sure. Consumer stocks have started, for instance, correcting as well. Um, what's the thought process around Indian IT companies? Because the rupee is still weak. So I don't know if that's kind of making people a little excited about the, the currency tailwind. So look, I, I think at the end of the day, corporate India has to deliver earnings. Mm -hmm. um, given the valuation levels that the market's trading at, as Pedro noted, we have to start to see positive earnings revisions moving forward. That hasn't happened for corporate India overall. However, what we learned over the course of the last quarter uh, earnings season was we are starting to see positive revisions in certain sectors, and they're largely the INR uh, driven sectors. So specifically, healthcare, IT services, you are seeing the material space also start to pick up, mm -hmm. which is interesting. On the consumer side, some of the more recent data points have also been quite exciting. So you're looking at consumer confidence, both urban and rural, mm -hmm. at its highest level since January 2017. Mm -hmm. So those would be the key sectors that we'd be focused on at this point. We don't see the U.S. dollar necessarily reversing, but mm -hmm. if we continue to have a period of dollar stability, then we think that the INR-focused sectors will continue to perform well. Pedro, one last very quick question. 
Uh, how you view the Indian government's response to the current situation that we seem to be in? Because suddenly we have these five steps that were announced. There's some talk that we might get into some format of import curbs. Uh, there's, there's a lot of talk about maybe there'll be a separate window to get the non-resident Indian deposit money in or not. But just your thoughts on the policy response, both from the Reserve Bank and from the Indian government at the moment. Yeah. So one step back. Mm -hmm. I think you should be proud about what this government has accomplished over the past few years. Not many emerging markets have underwent reforms in a moment of bonanza, right? And the Indian government was pretty proactive in taking very interesting steps towards them. Okay. So that's the structure. For the very short term, um, I, uh, we are factoring right now a proactive monetary policy stance, meaning two hikes uh, from now up until year end. So for us, I think that's a very good signal, if you're correct in our assessment about what's going to happen in the matter, that you are trying to send a signal to the market that uh, you care about Indian rupee depreciation and the potential pass-through of that into core inflation. So we applaud that. And on the fiscal front, we haven't seen much of that yet. So probably, let's say, oil is the one factor that you have no control and not much what to do in the short term. But from what we hear from government officials in these conferences, that that is sort of so, can call sacred institution, right? So you won't mess up with their fiscal equilibrium mm -hmm. because you know what is at risk at now. Okay. Well, let's hope it remains that way, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. You.